Welcome to joining us now on our Book Talk segment. Great to welcome, man, it's written kind of an interesting historical book, kind of reads like a novel as well. Very interesting topic. It's called The Statesman and the Storyteller, about two uh, people uh, in uh, American history, John Hay, Mark Twain, and the rise of American imperialism. We're joined today by Mark uh, Zwanzer up in New York City. Today we'll find out about it. And uh, Mark, good to talk with you. How are you? Uh, I'm great. Thanks for having me, Doc. Yeah, good to have a chance to chat with you. I had a chance to, to read, through, uh, read through the book, and uh, I guess most people have heard of uh, obviously Mark Twain or, or Sam Clemens, his, his real name uh, from his uh, his novels. You know, most kids had to read those, but not too many people, I guess, know about John Hay, who was uh, uh, back in what the turn of the last century, uh, Secretary of State. And these two uh, gentlemen kind of intersected, didn't they? Uh, yeah, they um, they did intersect. They intersected as young men back in the way back in the 1860s and remained uh, remained friends and acquaintances their entire lives. And this is this story takes place at the end of their lives when uh, big and momentous things were happening in the country, and uh, they were both kind of at the center of those things, uh, on opposite sides of many of the big political issues of the day, but remained uh, pretty good friends. It kind of, uh, when you read through it now, and I had heard a little bit about it, but obviously not uh, as much until I read through the book, uh, a bit of a controversial time in American history. I guess we always seem to have that, but that was uh, uh, an interesting time. Part of the title of the book says it, American imperialism. It had to do with uh, the Philippines and, uh, and and other parts of the world that uh, the U.S. kind of took over, right, or tried to take over. Well, it's a, it's a time where when the United States of America is really stepping on the world stage for the first time, um, somewhat tentatively and somewhat aggressively. But uh, uh, they were, we were trying to learn how to be a world power, I would, I would say, and uh, it didn't always go so well. Um, the, uh, you know, we ended up with control or, or outright ownership of, uh, of the Philippines, of Cuba, of Puerto Rico, of Guam, of Hawaii, of a little piece of the Samoan Islands, of a big part of Panama. So we were really stretching our, ourselves out in the world at that point in time. I guess part of it necessary for uh, defense and commerce and all that, but I guess not all of it was uh, was on the up and up either, wasn't it? Well, no, you know, and so often happens. I think that, you know, the, the idea, the impetus for this was with all the best of intentions, and the Spanish-American War was fought really with the express purpose of liberating the Cubans and liberating the Filipinos from Spanish misrule, and um, but, uh, so that was, the, that was the ideal, and it, it kind of devolved into something less than the ideal, and uh, which is what uh, John Hay had to wrestle with and what uh, Mark Twain was so upset about. Yeah, what, what gave you the uh, idea to, to write the book, uh, not only about the, the time period, but, but putting these two gentlemen's stories uh, together? How, how did that come about? Well, I first really wanted to write about the time period because I, I was thinking about this 10 years ago when the worst of the Iraq counterinsurgency was going on, and I was trying to figure out when was it this country, this the government of this country first got the notion that it could go almost anywhere in the world and have good effect, make good things happen, have good outcomes. And this was really the moment in time where that started to happen. And so I wanted to explore this because I, I think it's the moment in time when habits of conduct and habits of thought that, that still echo down through to present day uh, first began to be formed. Uh, I chose John Hay to write about because he was uh, at the center of these events as, as Secretary of State and earlier as uh, Ambassador in London. And uh, he was really a great vehicle for which to, to sort of navigate these, this 10-year period. But as I did more and more research, this guy, Sam Clemens, just kept popping up. And um, I was fascinated that they were friends and had remained friends in spite of the fact that they were so um, different in many ways, both personally and politically. And it allowed me to tell the story through a couple different points of view, which I thought made the whole bigger than the, than the sum of the parts. I was kind of interested, too, that I didn't realize, and you talk about it in the book, uh, uh, the financial problems that uh, Clemens had. You, you always kind of get the impression uh, he was a very successful writer almost from the beginning of his career, and he didn't have any money problems, but uh, he, he had a lot of issues with money, right, not having much at one time. Yeah, he he shouldn't have had money problems. He made plenty of money, but he spent plenty of money too, and he, he lost a good bit of money in a in his publishing in his own publishing company. He also 
put way too much money in uh, development of a printing press, which never came to pass. So when I pick up the story of his life in 1895, he is uh, about the equivalent of what in our our day would be about $2 million in debt. Mm. So he was working very, very hard to try to pay off that debt. He, he went around the world on a round-the-world tour, a lecture tour. Um, and one thing about Sam Clemens that's so fascinating is that he traveled more than any other American of his day, you would think. I mean, and he knew the world in a way that few did. I mean, he had he had put his feet in, in places like Hawaii and in, in India and, uh, I mean, all over the world. And he had a, you know, whereas John Hay and many of our national leaders knew plenty about Europe and had been in the, the, the halls of power all across Europe, uh, few knew these new places that we were uh, that we were throwing our weight around in like like Sam Clemens did. He was trying to associate Clemens uh, just with the South. I didn't realize he lived in New Hampshire for uh, for part of his life. Uh, well, well, actually, it was uh, uh, Hay was in New Hampshire. Clemens was in Hartford, Connecticut. See, Connecticut. I'm sorry, you're right, Connecticut. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's okay. Yeah, no, he grew up in the Midwest. He grew up out in Missouri, but he left Missouri as a as a young man, went west, and then back east. And in fact, the only house he ever really owned and lived in with his family was in Hartford, Connecticut. At the end of his life, he built a second house in in Reading, Connecticut, where he lived uh, basically alone, uh, except for friends and. Um, so yeah, Connecticut was a uh, kind of a, uh, a home for him for a long time. You talk about the the two presidents uh, within the book that a lot of this uh, happened under. Uh, talk about Cuba, Puerto Rico, Philippines, Hawaii, and all that with uh, America in those territories. McKinley, who not a lot is known about unless you really delve into the history books. But Teddy Roosevelt, that's one uh, every kid probably learns more about than anybody else. I, I went to his house in Sag Harbor when I was a kid. So uh, what, what were they well, like you know, to, uh, you know, to, how do they fit into the story as far as these two gentlemen? Well, it's interesting. McKinley was uh, was a, a reluctant, uh, reluctant to sort of push American America out onto the world stage. He was not interested in building up a big navy and having a huge military presence all over the place. But the, the deeper they got into this uh, into this project, uh, the more uh, uh, the more keen McKinley became on having it. And, and he actually, I found it interesting that McKinley started invoking God, and God wanted us to be doing out in the world. He had some doubts in the beginning, but they were that he didn't have them for long. Whereas Theodore Roosevelt was just uh he was ready to go stand to stride the world from the time he was about nine years old and uh right. and he was as much a driving force in this as any single human being he was assistant secretary of the navy in uh when the spanish american wars began and was as uh yeah, I mean, he was uh, he was as responsible as uh, you know. Remember the Maine and William Randolph Randolph Hearst uh, media empire for uh, he was as responsible as, as that for pushing us toward war. Yeah, he was probably and the last what, president what, to actually fight in a war. I mean, he would lead the troops, right? The Rough Riders and all that. I mean, he, he got right in there. <laughs> he, he, he did. He actually did fight as a Rough Rider and, and uh, was uh, quite brave and courageous. But you know, there's a funny thing that. John Hay um, is famous, uh, is well known for having called the Spanish American War a splendid little war. And some people thought that he was being a little bit callous and dismissive about, you know, the, the difficulties of war, the, the enormity of war. Well, actually, he wrote that a splendid little war in a private letter to Theodore Roosevelt. And in part, that letter was congratulating him as his for his um, for his performance. You have not seen a war like I have seen a war. I'm Stan Brock. 30 years ago, I formed Remote Area Medical to help people overseas. But then we found generations of families in America isolated by poverty from the health care they need. Together, we can take dental, vision, and medical help to a million adults and their kids right here at home in the United States of America. If you'd like to order the book we're talking about, please go to DougMilesMedia.com and enter the author's name in the Amazon search box. Thank you for listening. Please come back soon for more conversations here at DougMilesMedia.com.
This has been a presentation of Doug Miles Media, all rights reserved. You can listen to or download previous programs at iTunes, Stitcher.com, or Doug Miles Media.